paradox that says, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Sometimes life is all about perspective. Is it possible that some of our misconceptions and stereotypes of each other are a matter of a generational gap? Or is it a deeper societal change that is taking place? Whether that is true or not relies on the information given by people of different times. On generations, we will ask some compelling questions of baby boomers, generation Xers, millennials, and digital natives. How we view fear, accomplishment, advice, and even insight into the future is a matter of experience combined with point of view. With the help of four experts, we hope to better understand the connection among them as well as unfold their differences. Welcome to Generations. I'm Denise Schmidt. Today we're going to speak with four experts who will give us their insights into some of the responses our producers captured. Today we have with us Dr. Jill Shenham, Professor of Anthropology at County College of Morris. Welcome Dr. Shenham. Hello. I wonder if you could tell us just a little more about yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist who has done field work within the United States and I've studied um, deindustrialization, what happened to steel workers when they lost their jobs, and bigger questions of class transformation. Great. Well, I'd like now to start with our first question and here's some of the responses from folks in and around our area. As human beings are all born with an innate drive to achieve, to go out and accomplish goals we've set for ourselves, to conquer every obstacle that lies in our path, and complete what we have set out to do. What determines these goals, and why do some people endure relentlessly while others lose the will to keep going? Does culture, location, or even the generation they belong to play a role in the drive to achieve? Cameron, I'm 24 years old. Hello, my name is Doug Bush. I'm 58 years old. Меня зовут Вера Данилова. Мне 60 лет. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm nine. And my name is Derek Lewis. I am 26 years old. Hi, I'm Lupe. I'm 14 years old. My name is Henry Ortega. I'm 71 years old. My name is Alio and I'm 35. Hi, my name is Ashley. I'm 24 years old. Uh, my name is Alan Saldani. I'm 19 years old. Okay, my name is Bert Moore. I'm 63 years old. Hi, my name is Cameron. I'm 24 years old. And one thing I'd like to do in my life is educate as many people as I possibly can about organ donation uh, due to the fact that I was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease and I'm actually going to be undergoing a transplant in January. So as many as people uh, that I can tell about, you know, people who are needing or of organs, uh, you know, I'd like to, to touch people's lives and to help give people a second chance at life. Hi, my name is Dante, and a goal that I want to accomplish in life is to become a professional football player. I want to accomplish this goal because I think it's cool that your occupation is to play the sport that you love. What do I want to accomplish in life? Well, there hasn't been much that I haven't accomplished already. This is the fourth state I've lived in in a year. But the main goal would to be have a family. That's what I want to do with my life. Get married and have a family. That's about it. So The thing I would most like to accomplish in my life is to eliminate all the fears. Raging fear of death, fear of failure, fear of success, fear of judgment, rejection. Um, any fears that would hold me back. I think by doing that, I could more fully 
engage my passions, um, pursue all my more material and earthly goals, and uh, live a much fuller life. Я приехал из России. Я хочу, чтобы Америка и Россия дружили. Something that I want to accomplish in life is school and college so I can have a good job and a good life. The one thing I want to accomplish in life is to become a CEO of a, of a human services uh, company because I want to bridge the gap between the criminal justice system and the behavioral health services that they receive while they're incarcerated. Um, what I want to accomplish in life is to become a singer because I've always loved music and I've always wanted to make music into a career. But since I don't know if that's going to happen for sure, I've always had a plan B to go to medical school and become a doctor because um, my mom says it's good to have a stable job if the first career that you really want doesn't work out for you. So I can support myself later in life. I want to get a lot more out of life for the next couple of years. I'll be retired now for, since I was 52. Go out and do what makes you feel good, do what makes you happy, don't hurt nobody, and enjoy life. It's too short. That's about it. What I would like to accomplish is stop moving around so much with my family. Since 2001, we've been in six or seven different places. So I would like to settle down and be professionally successful, make a partner of beauty. One thing I'd like to accomplish in life is joining the armed forces and supporting my country and becoming successful. Uh, what I want to accomplish in life uh, is probably have a business of my own, something like a restaurant, something like that. Well-off restaurant, yeah. One thing I want to accomplish in life, or I could perhaps say with my life, is just to be the kind of person that God would want me to be. To follow after Him and to do it with everything I can. Wow, as we listen to those accomplishments, we hear quite a range from the very practical to the pretty lofty. Um, it makes you wonder though, which of those folks will achieve those goals? What will the difference be? And, and some would say it's the desire to achieve, to, to reach your goals. And, and uh, so as we begin this conversation, I wonder if you could speak to the extent to which you think parents influence their child's uh, desire to succeed and and to to work toward those goals that they set. I think that sociologists and anthropologists would say that parents or family are a very important agent mm -hmm. of socialization mm -hmm. or enculturation and do transmit goals and values to children. Um, but families also have different structures, so mm -hmm. I don't think we can think of parents as necessarily being two biological parents. It can be a single mother, an extended family. Mm -hmm. It could be step parents. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that, that family is an important agent of socialization. But we need to allow for other factors, mm -hmm. I hear. Um, that said, today immigration is, is uh, on everyone's minds. Um, we have folks coming from all over the world, uh, as we have always, but perhaps more so now. And uh, certainly that brings different cultures, different religious orientations. Could you speak to that in terms of this drive to succeed? Well, we saw a, a Russian mother who immigrated here um, and expressed ideals and goals that she had and perhaps first generation immigrants um, might have uh, ideas about success in the United States mm -hmm. uh, and attaining that success through hard work. Um, but I think we also have to understand that immigrants themselves are very diverse and so a working class immigrant coming to this country and hoping to succeed through hard work mm -hmm. might be very different than a professional coming sure. and not being able to practice as a doctor mm -hmm. in this new country and having to take more, more menial labor. But um, I guess those different situations might have different influences on children as well. Sure, and religious orientation. Certainly that was mm -hmm. important to 
Mm -hmm. So One someone's of, cultural background or mm -hmm. religious orientation mm -hmm. might shape mm -hmm. goals mm -hmm. and, and ambitions. Right, right, right. Um, how about the economy? What, what impact do you think that has on, on people's expectations and, and those accomplishments they put out there for themselves? Well, I think that the baby boomer generation some of the older people that we saw in this film, grew up in a period in the United States, the post-World War II industrial period, mm -hmm. when they had the expectation of doing better than their parents. Mm -hmm. They expected that with hard work, they would be able to have a secure job or a career path that would give them social mobility and a middle-class lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, today, I don't think young people feel that way. Um, jobs are insecure and unstable. Mm -hmm. We saw a couple of people have moved numerous times and wish they didn't have to move so often, but mm -hmm. often these flexible jobs demand that. Right. Um, uh, people switch careers often mm -hmm. frequently during their course of their working mm -hmm. life today. And mm -hmm. we saw a young person saying she felt she needed the backup career, a that plan B. just mm -hmm. having one, one career goal wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's much more insecurity and instability as young mm -hmm. people move out into the labor market. And I have heard um, that this generation may be the first, the, the generation, uh, the millennials, I'm sorry, uh, that will not necessarily be able to do better than mm -hmm. their parents. Mm -hmm. um, and imagine they're coming mm -hmm. into work burdened with heavy student loan mm -hmm. debt, uh, which also might influence and affect choices about going to graduate school or right. what kind of job they can take. Right, and they come from a family of two career earners. Mm -hmm. um, so they kind of maxed out at what you could achieve in that regard, so certainly. How about gender? Um, how does gender play into this drive to succeed? Well, I think for the older generation, for the baby boomers, gender expectations were very different mm -hmm. than they are for younger generations. Mm -hmm. So um, they grew up in families in which, um, for really the only time in the United States, mm -hmm. the male breadwinner and stay-at-home homemaker right was the uh, norm right. uh, for American families. Mm -hmm. um, and so those expectations about um, future goals were shaped differently mm -hmm. in those families. For younger people, they've grown up in dual earner families mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in which their mothers are out there working, have uh, all kinds of different career goals and expectations. Mm -hmm. And young women certainly have those kinds of expectations today. But I think also men might have different expectations about their roles today. So many young mm -hmm. men might expect to have a much greater role in child rearing mm -hmm. um, than the baby boomers did. Yeah, wow. And how about uh, influence of the social circles and peer groups, that kind of thing on these different generations? Yeah, so, so sociologists would say that mm -hmm. peer groups are a uh, very important agent of socialization. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so one might imagine that, you know, uh, one's peers are uh, from different classes, depending right. on one's own class background. Mm -hmm. uh, ethnic groups, mm -hmm. uh, maybe religious groups, right. Right. Um, cultural backgrounds, mm -hmm. and so all of those also would, I imagine, shape Mm -hmm. uh, people's we think goals of and peer pressure. I'm sorry, we mm -hmm. think of peer pressure as an adolescent thing, but certainly even as we get older, it's the, you know, contact we have with others who may, we may perceive to be more successful and maybe that contributes to our drive to succeed or, mm -hmm. or quite the opposite, I suppose, as well. Well, um, do you think people change what they wish to accomplish as they age? Um, I think that people have different goals at different places in the life cycle. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we saw mm -hmm. a young person who wants to be a professional football player, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and that's lovely, mm -hmm. but I mm -hmm. don't imagine he will have that goal His in 10 years. Perhaps <laughs> not. We'll see. Well, it's been really a pleasure speaking with you, and uh, I appreciate the insights that you've brought to us today. Uh, so I want to thank you very much, Dr. Shenham, for being here, and uh, I'd like to just um, again thank you, and, and we'll be back uh, after this message.
Nobody has to get stuck with a lemon. Visit the Lemon Law Unit at njconsumeraffairs.gov to learn more. Welcome back to Generations. I'm Denise Schmidt. With me is our next guest, Jill Wells. She's the Coordinator of Academic Advisement at County College of Morris. Welcome, Jill. Thanks, Denise. Could you tell us briefly about yourself? Sure, I've uh, been at County College of Morris now for 20 years and I'm the Coordinator of Academic Advisement. And the major part of that job is to connect students and their faculty advisors. But I do a little bit of uh, advice giving myself at times as well. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start now with our second question and hear the responses of the people in and around our area. A large portion of our lives is spent under the control of parents or guardians. They teach us right from wrong and how to take care of ourselves. But some advice tends to stick with us longer than most. The truth is that good advice doesn't always come from someone close to you. Sometimes the best advice comes from the person you weren't expecting it to. Everyone experiences life a bit differently, which means everyone has information to share. All you have to do is ask. My name is Vinay Kushi. I'm 26 years old. I'm here from Bangalore, India. And I'm an actor myself. I'm here for a movie shooting. So I'm very glad to be here on Brooklyn Bridge because uh, New York is basically a wonderful city with a lot of dreams. Hi, my name is Jean and I am 53 years old. and I am soon to be 50 years old and the best advice I've ever received was right before I got married and my best friend told me not to ever tell my parents about my argument with my husband because I would eventually forgive him but they would never forget and it must have worked because we've been married 27 years. The best advice was that the life is only a play. You can every time playing. Nothing is only serious. We play our life. That was the best advice. I got the best advice from my parents as a youngster. Always be good, be honest, don't have any fear, because fear can make you loony. Just count your blessings daily and say your prayers at night love everybody. My name is Mike, I'm 37 years old, and the best advice I got is if you got a dream, you better just go for it, because if you wait around for it, you might not ever do it. And that's what I'm doing. I'm going across the country right now with my dog, and this is my version of the American dream. So, there you go. The best advice I have ever received was before my swimming competition. My coach told me if I ever got nervous to just shake it off and keep going. Well, it was that my mother lived with me and she was very cranky. And um, I got this book by Father Lafarge on, on uh, you know, attitude when you're getting older. And I gave it to her and she threw it at me. And I was about 55 years old, and I, 
When I read that book, I said, yes, this is it. It's attitude, you know, how you look at things. And uh, he, he, that book gave me the key, growing old gracefully in God's grace. You just have, have to look at the positive. And when the negative thoughts come in, you chase them. They're from the devil. If I have to say one good advice that I've got is that in the course of being extraordinary, all of us have forgotten to be ordinary. So it's necessary for us sometimes to touch base with ourselves and to understand and to be ordinary and then work towards your extraordinary thing, you know, being exclusive. So as an actor, that's what I believe and uh, all of us are here to do something. So what do you feel like? The best advice I've ever gotten was to never feel guilty for erasing toxic people from your life because it will pull you down if you don't. <laughs> When you're as old as me, you've gotten lots of advice. I don't know about the best advice, but one of them is, you know, take one day at a time and try not to worry about tomorrow because it's not here yet, and don't worry about yesterday because you can't change anything anyhow. That's the major one that comes to mind. The best advice I've ever received is from my uncle. He said never give up when you want to try something new it is the best advice because it shows because it shows to believe in yourself and never give up. Hey, my name is Marco. I'm 24 years old and yeah, the best advice I ever received is actually pretty simple. Um, just be yourself and be confident because with that you can reach a lot of your goals in your life. Yeah. The best advice I've ever received is to follow your dreams because that inspires me to be true to myself. It's not what someone told me, it's what I read. It said that no matter how much we worry, the end result will be the end result. So don't stress. That's what I read. Uh, there was a brother that lived here and he had this little um, plaque he gave to me and it said on it, uh, for every moment of your anger, it's a moment wasted that you'll never get back. So that too hit home because it's true. So with time. So Jill, what's the best advice you've ever given someone? Well, at uh, County College of Morris, we see a lot of students that come to us who might not know what they really want to do. And one of the things that, I, that seems to be a theme for me is to make sure that the students follow their passion. Uh, I think passion really can lengthen their career. We see a lot of people who come back after doing something that made them a lot of money, but that they didn't like doing. And it doesn't seem to be something that can uh, be long lasting when you don't work for some, with something that you love. Mm -hmm. For a reason other than money. Exactly. Right. right. So have you ever been reluctant to give someone advice that you really felt they needed to hear? Yes. Um, at the at my uh, job, we often have students that come back and they have very lofty goals of going into a field that they've been told to go into, a business field, um, a medical field, a field that they don't really have the necessarily that aptitude for, they only have that interest, and so they find uh, themselves struggling in school. And so sometimes I've said to them that they may want to take a realistic look at uh, these types of career goals and possibly go into and stay within the field that they're enjoying, but maybe not go into uh, the field of medicine and to become a long, uh, long range goal of a doctor, for example. Mm -hmm. To choose an allied health field, perhaps. Exactly. That's more to their, to their abilities. That's great. So um, after watching and listening to these responses, can you personally relate to anything that you've heard? Yes, I can relate to a lot. Almost at all ages, I can relate to something, but I very much seem to relate to the people in my age category. Mm -hmm. And I loved the woman who said that worry changes nothing, um, that it ends up the same result whether you worry or not. I think that's a great uh, piece of advice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which age group do you think was giving the best advice? 
I think they all gave great advice. It was very interesting listening to the people in their 80s and 90s give advice. Um, a lot of wisdom there. Um, the children that were interviewed, uh, very small pieces of, of life that they um, uh, were talking about, but they gave great advice too. But I, I think I, I stuck with the people that were uh, closest to my age group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, were the responses what you expected when you saw the young children and, and the older folks? Did, you, did they say what you thought they would say? They did, and uh, in fact, the people in their 20s, I love the idea of just sort of going for it, um, you know, being who you are. I, I just think that's great advice, and, um, and I think people at my age need to kind of hearken back to that and remember that you, you really do want to be that kind of person in this world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think, too, the, the theme of dreams was much more prevalent in the younger folks, and then the right. the fifty somethings maybe not so much. Right. And by the time we heard from the ninety somethings, they were talking about attitude and you know exactly. staying positive and so forth. So, um, has the advice has advice in general changed? Would you say over your lifetime? Over my lifetime, for sure. I mean, the information age and where so many of the young people, including my own children, get advice from. Uh, online, through Facebook. Um, we have to be mindful that this is just where they're getting a lot of their, uh, their information from. So mm -hmm. it has changed. Mm -hmm. What's the best advice you've ever gotten? Definitely from my dad, who told me, never look at somebody's insides to judge their outsides. In other words, um, you don't know their insides. Um, you don't know what's going on with people for good and for not so good. So they could look great on the outside and on the inside they might be struggling. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've imparted that advice to my own children because high school is not an easy place to, to be these days. And so it's something that I've, I've often find myself uh, saying to them because you really don't know. Mm -hmm. Just don't know what people mm -hmm. are going through. I know uh, the older folks, even in their 90s, were still referring back to advice they got from their parents uh, and how important that is as parents, that we remember that what we say may stay with them, even if we don't know it does. And I know my mother said, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, and felt that would really solve a lot of problems in the world. Right, and uh -huh. I think uh, to a degree it does. And um, it's always important to just keep communicating, keep talking, because even though it appears that sometimes people are not listening to you, they, they are hearing you uh, to some extent. And mm -hmm. so I think it's important to just kind of keep giving that message out uh, mm -hmm. personally. Uh, right, yeah. right. And professionally, I suppose, there's some yes. of that that comes into play as well. That's yes, great. Yes, I definitely uh, do quite a bit of that at my work. I do. Yeah, very good. And I, I'm involved in uh, some career counseling and do the same thing. So I appreciate very much your insights. Um, I wonder if you could share with us, maybe from a uh, more of a professional standpoint, how you see uh, your role and, and the role of, of faculty perhaps here in terms of giving advice and advising our students. That's really a great question because I think what I read and what I, what I see is that connecting with somebody uh, mm -hmm. at an educational institution mm -hmm. like CCM is so very important for student success. And when a student can connect with a, a faculty member, a staff member, and when the advice that they can give to them is really not just told but just very much communicated in a way that's uh, considerate and, and thoughtful, I think it really could change the student's um, path in mm -hmm. life as to what mm -hmm. they do. Mm -hmm. It really personalizes the experience for the student and they feel as though they matter. Absolutely. That's great. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time today and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Our next guest 
is Dr. Olivia Hetzler. She's an assistant professor of sociology at County College of Morris. Welcome, Dr. Hetzler. Thank you for having me. Could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I actually, um, I just moved to New Jersey about a year ago. Uh, I finished my PhD in sociology at the University of Missouri, Columbia. I also have my master's from there um, in sociology. I got my BA in psychology from Columbia College and just started, this is my third semester at County College of Morris as an assistant professor. Great, mm -hmm. well welcome to CCM. Thank you. Uh, let's begin uh, now with our third question and watch and listen to the responses of people in and around our area. Today is the youngest you'll ever be and the oldest you have ever been. This is a view and a culture that is wholly Western because as Americans, it is who we are as a people. Every day something new is created or discovered that advances our health, education, and even entertainment. Our drive and curiosity is natural. Our desire to improve our future is unstoppable. What is next for the generation to come? My name is Chu Lin. I'm 35. All right, my name is Peter Noah Selecki. I'm 24 years old. Hi, I'm Sabina Von Alok, and I'm 16. Uh, when I think of the future, I think of money. Uh, when I think of the future, I think of the possibilities for opportunity, um, really to do anything with your life, have all your dreams come true. Uh, of course, it means a lot of work and stuff, but. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I see the uh, the future. It's uh, endless. You can do whatever you want to do. I hope that you have the courage and the passion to do a much better job than we did to stand on the side of love. Simply that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm 13 years old. Hi, my name is Dennis Dempsey. I'm 53 years old. Hey guys, I'm Ray. I'm 19 years old. My hopes and dreams for the future generations is just that everyone will be generally nice to each other. Murders will go down, bullying will go down, and the world will just be a better place for people to live in. Uh, as far as the future goes, we're going to see some real changes, uh, hopefully for the better. I'm excited about it because I think there's a lot of good people in the world. We just have to, uh, have to realize that and realize peace. So in the future, I hope to see like flying cars, hover carts, you know, running on electricity, using less gas, less oil. My name is Mackenzie and I'm 14 years old. My hope for the future generation is that we become less technology reliant and more independent. All right, my name is John Perna. I'm 26 years old. And when I think of the future, I think of growth, opportunity, where will I be professionally, how will I get there? Anthony Marquito, 50 years old, and I'd like to see world peace and economic prosperity for uh, the future generations. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paloma, and I'm 13 years old. And what I hope for future generations is not to be as lazy using technology all the time. Brian Kenny, age 44, and I would like to see peace, but I would settle for especially at home, just a little less divisiveness. Hi, my name is David, I'm 24 years old. Hi, my name is Nancy Ancisco, and I'm 67. One of the things I'd like to see with future generations, mainly in regards to uh, education and schools, is there's a lot of bullying things that are going on right now, and there's a lot of rules that are trying to be made about people saying, hey, stop bullying me, or this or that, and they're trying to pretty much teach kids to not deal with their problems, but instead be able to ignore them. It's not something that's gonna happen in the real world for them. So I'd like to see them more try to help them deal with the problems than try to avoid the problems. If they can do that, I think everyone else will be a lot better off in the future. And what I think of the future, I think our future is very bright, and there's a lot of young people coming up today, and I feel that they're going to start to change the world 
to where it should be again with a lot of more peace in the world and more technology to help straighten things out in our future. So I wish everybody the best of luck, especially the young people that are coming up today. Well, we have lots to talk about. Um, so let's start, as a sociologist, did you notice any patterns in what you heard between the generations? I did. I noticed um, that each of the generations were talking about different, different concerns, you know, different hopes that they had for the future. Uh, and it was really related to kind of their relationship to the world around them, what institutions mm -hmm. they're involved in. Um, so we heard from the younger generation, uh, you know, they were really critical of technology, which I thought was surprising. Um, they were hoping for less technology, people being tied less to technology in, um, in, in their lives. They also mentioned, um, you know, they wanted people to be more kind of uh, engaged in, in the world around them. Um, also saying, you know, speak up, you know, mm -hmm. um, more individualization, um, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the, you know, the young, the young adults, you know, kind of in the 20s and 30s, um, we heard a lot about jobs, money. Um, economic prosperity, uh, that, you know, having those opportunities available. And of course that relates to kind of where they are in the world, um, that they're starting out on careers. You know, what's going to be available for me? Uh, and, you know, really hoping that for future generations that those opportunities are there. Um, and then in the older generation, um, we heard a lot of world peace, um, that they were hoping for less conflicts, less wars. Um, also for the world to be a little bit maybe easier on the younger generation. Um, and, you know, really, you know, kind of looking to them and saying, you know, this is kind of in your hands and good luck. You know, we, we hope it goes well for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, each, each of them were talking about very different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that there must have been some sociological research done, some studies on this subject. Can you give us an idea of some of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking a lot about what, what the younger generation was saying, um, you know, they're really concerned about uh, involvement in their community, how um, people are involved with their worlds, and it probably has a lot to do with the fact that they see so many people, them themselves are probably tied to technology in these ways, um, and, you know, what this means for helping others, um, what this means for helping their world. Um, you know, someone, you know, even said, you know, get out there, do something, help people. And um, it, it reminded me of a book that was written by Robert Putnam in 2000. He's a political scientist. And he noticed this decline in civic engagement that um, even though people were still kind of joining organizations, they weren't doing anything. They weren't getting out there. They weren't interacting. Mm -hmm. um, so they were kind of joining from behind screens, mm -hmm. um, you know, that you could maybe like something on Facebook and thus you remember. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that, um, you know, he uses the bowling league saying, you know, that people still bowl, but no one's doing it together. So what does this mean? Um, mm -hmm. If people aren't engaged in their communities, how are we ever going to make change if we're, you know, we're not getting together, we're not talking about it? Mm -hmm. well, Sally Raskoff, um, she's a sociologist and comes back and says, well, maybe we see a decline in civic participation in this way, that maybe people aren't going, you know, joining bowling leagues or going to, you know, you know, an Elks mm. Club meeting or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. But they are still engaged in their community that, uh, you know, we see volunteer rates have actually mm -hmm. gone up. Mm -hmm. um, so volunteering is still, you know, of course, very important and, and still mm -hmm. very present. Mm -hmm. um, also, technology kind of gives us these positive opportunities. A lot of times we look at the negatives, um, but then some of the benefits of technology are that we can have, you know, um, opportunities to raise awareness. We have change.org. You can sign an online petition. Mm -hmm. You can donate money online. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunities uh, that technology gives us as well. Right. You touched on the fact a little bit ago um, that the, the very young uh, seem to be more negative um, about technology mm -hmm. than certainly I would have expected. Could yeah. you expand Wasn't on that, that a little? Yeah. Um, yeah. You was. know, when the way I made sense of it is I looked at, you know, even of the young adults, they haven't been, you know, raised with technology in a way and experienced technology in the same way that the young adults do. You know, their, you know, their entire lives, they've really been kind of inundated with, with technology, um, you know, technology in schools, technology in their social lives. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that they've seen 
a lot more of the negatives than, than we have certainly mm -hmm. seen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think technology kind of raises issues of fear. You know, there's um, cyber predators. Um, you know, there's cyber bullying. And there's, there's all these mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. that they deal with on a different level than young adults and certainly the older generations, too. Mm -hmm. In fact, one um, of the Generation X folks mentioned uh, wanting peace at home. Mm -hmm. and spoke of divisiveness, spelled that way, as in devices, uh -huh. as, as being an issue. Do you feel as though the reaction of those young people might be influenced by what they're hearing from their parents at home? Yeah, I would think it would certainly have to. Um, you know, and of the, you know, parents that I've spoken to, I don't know anyone that hasn't been, seen the negative effects of technology, you know, that people mm -hmm. are maybe eating, eating dinner around a TV or, um, you know, the presence of, you know, laptops and iPads and, and place mm -hmm. of conversation. So I certainly think that um, kind of negative uh, kind of outlook on technology would certainly come in the home and certainly kind of color the young's perception of technology, too. Yeah, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting, when this question was first proposed, uh, the thinking was that it would be, what do you want for the future? Everybody would be talking about s landing on Mars or space vehicles or living on Mars, <laughs> I should say. Um, how do you feel about um, the fact that that didn't happen? I think one person mentioned cars that could fly. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The, the what, what I, how I made sense of it, and I hope that I'm reading this right. Um, and if so, I think it's very smart. Um, but <laughs> the, um, you know, if we have this rapid change, which we know that rapid change um, causes disruption in society, so if we don't fix those issues on the ground, oh. economic opportunities, world peace, those things, and then we're bringing in more mm -hmm. technology, you know, I, I don't think that the, the outlook would be very good, so I think it's very smart to start on the ground before we move on to hover cars. Right, uh -huh. right, that won't matter if we can't fix these larger social issues that we have and so forth. Right. Interesting, would you say, from what you saw in today's video that, and the students that you've taught of different ages, that it's fairly representative of what you're seeing in the classroom? Um, I think so, I think so. Uh, I think there are very valid concerns. There's concerns certainly that we hear, you know, I hear in the classroom, I hear outside of the classroom, just in daily um, talk. Mm -hmm. You know, we were mm -hmm. even just having a talk about technology a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how it's kind of changed change our lives and and so I do think that you know the, the issues brought up in the video and from these people um, I think that they're really kind of representative about you know a, a lot of our kind of fears and hopes for mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looking back at uh, some of the what the older generation spoke of and and you've touched on some of this uh, referring to the fact that they didn't get done what they had wanted to get done. Um, do you believe that that's what the baby boomers would would kind of say as a way, as a consensus that we thought we could but we failed and we hope the younger generations can do better than we did? In some ways, yes, but then in some ways, maybe not. Mm -hmm. There's, um, a, a, it's a sociologist at University of New Hampshire and he talks about juvenoia, oh. that mm -hmm. people always, um, older generations always saying, you know, back in our day it used to be this <laughs> way and this uh, was the right way right. and the way you're doing it's all wrong. Right. Um, so yeah. in some ways, yeah. maybe not. Great. Mm -hmm. Juvenile, I love it. <laughs> we'll be right back. Here's the thing about being an unlicensed professional. I could be the guy who drills your teeth and repairs the roof you live under, or even the guy that cuts your hair. And what can you do to stop me? Don't hire unlicensed professionals. First, check with the New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs. Our final guest is Kobe Blair Morgan. He's a professor of psychology at County College of Morris. Welcome, Kobe. Thank you, Denise. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a professor of psychology here at the college at CCM, and I'm also a life coach, counselor, and lawyer. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, let's watch the video okay. and listen to the responses to the final question for Sounds today. Good. Okay. Fear is a vital response to physical or emotional danger. 
If we didn't feel it, we couldn't protect ourselves from legitimate threats. Fears are individual, societal, inherent, and learned. They are different depending on the person and the generation. What one may fear, another may not. Sometimes exposing ourselves to our inner demons is the best way to move past them, while other times there is no better alternative than to bury them. I'm Robert Luke Antonek and I'm a photographer. I've been shooting for many years. When you get to the age of 45, you begin to think about life. My greatest fear, I think, is death. Because in death, it's all unknown. At least in life, the unknown can somehow be knowable. Maybe through the camera, maybe through the way we see life. But afterwards, I have no clue. I think that's what scares me the most. Hi, my name is Jack and I'm 15. Hi, my name is Karen Atkins, I'm 59. My name is Elizabeth and I am nine years old. My name is Jonathan Silva, I'm 25 years of age. Hello, my name is Michael, I'm 68 years old. Hello, my name is Hilda Heigl. I'm 83 years old. Hi, my name is Tom, I'm 42 years old. My name is Ananda, I'm 26 years old. My name is Anne, I'm 52 years old. Hello, my name is Archie Denport, and I'm 14 years old. Hi, my name is Amanda. And I'm 43 years old. Hi, my name is Ian David. I'm 32 years old. My biggest fear is snakes, because when I was three years old, I went to a zoo and they escaped and I ran like a little girl. That's my biggest fear. And my biggest fear is snakes, because I grew up in Kansas and there's all kinds of rattlesnakes. And my biggest fear is I'm afraid of heights because I'm scared I'm going to fall and hit my head. My biggest fear is complacency. Because once you come be become complacent with with life, then what there's not much life to live. You lose being happy and my greatest fear is not one for myself but for the future of my grandchildren what the world will be like down the road thank you my biggest fear is that one of my children should go to heaven before I would and my biggest fear is going through life and realizing I haven't really done anything that meaningful. Um, being in a city like New York, there's so much distraction and so many things to do, like shopping, and uh, I think my biggest fear is one day I'm going to wake up and realize that uh, I haven't done anything but eat, shop, and work, so that's my biggest fear. And I am afraid of getting stuck and staying in one place for too long. I'm young, the world's a big place, and I don't know if this, you know, where I choose to be right now is where I want to be forever. My biggest fear is not being able to find work. My biggest competition is the 20-something-year-old generation. And my biggest fear is clowns, because when I was three years old, one jumped on me. And um, now I watch movies where they, they have knives and they like go around and they have funny faces. My biggest fear is fear. I think uh, being afraid of something, the mental side is worse than actually anything happening. And you can spend your life, you can ruin your life actually being afraid of things and not actually getting anywhere. I do not have any fears. I don't fear anything. There's nothing that I fear in life. The reason why I don't have anything to fear is because I believe what doesn't kill you specifically only makes you stronger. That is the truth of life. 
What only matters to me is I understand and I know that everyone is put on this earth for a reason. And the reason that you're actually, or I am actually put on this earth is to make other people's lives better. So that is my reason and that is my reason to live and be. And that is the reason why I have absolutely nothing to fear. I think a good place to start would be with a definition of fear. Could you share yours with us? Sure, Denise. I think a, a good baseline definition for fear is a person's emotional response to immediate, real, impending danger. Mm -hmm. That's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. With that understanding, mm -hmm. uh, could you reflect on the responses absolutely. that we heard mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps share some analysis with mm -hmm. us, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are three words that came to mind when I was watching uh, the videos. And uh, I think the first word was uh, diverse. The responses were very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, the second word that came to mind while I was watching the response is, uh, is sincere or sincerity. The, the responses were very transparent, were very honest and real. I didn't feel like the persons were performing, uh, but I thought that they were being sincere and transparent uh, in terms of those things that cause or induce a sense of fear in their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the last thing that I would say about the responses is that they were distinguishable. Uh, some of the persons that were responding to what is their biggest fear, it appeared as if some persons were um, articulating anxieties and not necessarily fears or phobias, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was interesting. Right. I'd like to come back to that in okay. a little bit. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, how about generational differences? Yes, without question. Mm -hmm. uh, what I noticed immediately was that um, the older the interviewees were, mm -hmm. um, the more they were beginning to talk about the future. Um, uh, ambiguous mm -hmm. um, life stage accomplishments. Mm -hmm. Um, that they were uh, in some way, shape, or form becoming preoccupied with, whether or not it was fulfillment in life, whether or not it was um, engaging their authentic true self, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they were uh, going to become fulfilled, mm -hmm. whether or not they were going to accomplish their goals. They were less specific um, uh, and more so centered on the future in mm -hmm. terms of um, maximizing their potential, if you will, or as Abraham Maslow would say, becoming self-actualized. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the very young mm -hmm. were very concrete yeah, in their absolutely. fears. There were very real things in this world, clowns absolutely. and snakes. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and then as we got to the 30-year-olds, much more philosophical. That's right. That's right. You know, what do I want to be? That's right. Where am I headed and why? Mm -hmm. and, and where should I go? Mm -hmm. I think th that would be one of the key distinguishing characteristics between a fear and an anxiety. Okay. A fear is a person's emotional response to impending present danger. Mm -hmm. An anxiety is a preoccupation or a state of worry okay. that uh, a person becomes inundated with mm -hmm. or preoccupied with or overwhelmed with based on a future desire or a future goal. Um, a clown is in front of you. That's mm -hmm. not something you're necessarily thinking about next week. Mm -hmm. A snake is that, that's something that induces or triggers a response that's a little bit different than I want to make sure that my grandchildren are taken care of mm -hmm. or at the end of the day I want to make sure that I've maximized my potential and fulfilled my purpose. That's a different mm -hmm. feeling or emotional mm -hmm. uh, response than being afraid of heights, if you will. Right, and to your point, the theme of death popped up the mm -hmm. older we get mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. and I think too the even the photographer he kind of I think nailed it when he said death is it's a fear of the unknown that's right and you know up until then maybe you feel like you have some control over that's your right. life and and then you get to that stage and that's not right. so much that's right well the legendary uh, social scientist Eric Erickson would say that as we get to that generative stage that middle age and above we start to reflect on um, 
whether or not we've accomplished our goals, whether or not mm -hmm. we have become or are becoming everything that we've set out to become in life. Um, in elementary school, the kids are thinking about the fear of heights, snakes, mm -hmm. and clowns, whereas as we get older, we start thinking about generations mm -hmm. and we start thinking right. about the legacy that, that we want to leave mm -hmm. and whether or not the legacy is going to be si right. significant or not. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that as um, the persons became older, their fears transitioned more to anxieties mm -hmm. um, as opposed mm -hmm. to having uh, fears of impending present dangers, sure. whether or not it's a bear or a, a tiger or something like that. Right, right. So if we accept that there is this anxiety among mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. the older we get, mm -hmm. uh, how would you say that that is, is evident in society? Are we a more anxious society? Yeah, I, I would say uh, without question. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, with the technological revolution, um, I think in general, regardless of our age and mm -hmm. stage in life, I think with um, the increase of cell phones, the increase of uh, social media and uh, computer technology, we've had a difficult time uh, engaging and accepting and uh, valuing the present, the here and now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're multiple places at one time and uh, it seems like, specifically with the younger generation, um, tomorrow and somewhere else mm -hmm. is oftentimes more of the preoccupation than engaging the person and the place and the experience that's present. And I think that can lead to anxiety when you're, you're constantly thinking about tomorrow right. and that right. other place as opposed to valuing and engaging right, um, right. interpersonal content. Tremendous insights, I mm -hmm. thank you so much. I want to thank our, all of our guests tonight, Dr. Jill Shenham, Jill Wells, Dr. Olivia Hetzler, and of course, Kobe Blair Morgan. Thank you. That's all for Generations. Thank you for watching.